God bless brought you. our special guest. Thank God he came a long way to do this, and he's gets up early and works a long days of the job, but he's spending his time with us to encourage us and teach us. The teacher himself, Pastor Earl, and his wife. Hallelujah. Thank God that she finally made it on, on with us. Pastor Vicki, thank you for showing thank up. You. What I want to talk about, and this is what Pastor Earl Talk was invented for, is sharing our testimony. How do we get into the ministry and why it's so important for you to know, not so much about what we did, but there one of us here will touch you. And he'll say, wait a minute, that's how I started, or that's how I got in the ministry, or I want to be in the ministry, how do I go about it? We'll answer all those questions in the next 55 minutes. First off, leadership. We could pan out a little bit so we could see Pastor Vicki. I'd appreciate it. So leadership is short path to failure if we don't admit we don't know everything. We show vulnerability and allow strengthening relationships with the team. So let's start off with Apostle Cora. You, let's take us, how did you get into the ministry? Take us around, well, we've heard a lot of your testimony. Take us around uh, the last 10 years, how you started, you traveled the world and how that went and what brought you to this point where you're sitting with me tonight? Okay, so back in 2016 in March, I was asked to go to Egypt um, from one of the people that I was doing a TV um, series with and his parents lived in Egypt and I said okay you know I was like I'm excited to go and so anyway I ended up going there for three months and and uh, then I came back and then I met some more pastors that are coming on the TV program we're doing interviews and basically what happened is a pastor from Uganda said hey you have to come to Uganda I'm like you gotta be kidding me I'm like Uganda and so I went there and then it just kept on going he invited me to China um, he's the one that took me to China, and the first two weeks I was in Hong Kong, um, they said, oh, you're going to have to go back home because you need to get a visa to go into China. And I said, well, you know, God didn't bring me halfway around the world for me not to get that visa because they were, all of them were saying, so they're being negative. And I'm like, you know what? I rebuked those first. I said, I, I'm going to get my visa. Four days later, I got my Chinese visa. And then wow. at, at that point in time that I stayed in China, I was going back and forth from, from Hong Kong and in, in into China for one year. And then from one, in that year, then I went to um, Indonesia. Um, I went to Vietnam. I went to Israel, where I actually got to minister with 40 Chinese people. And mm -hmm. it was such an amazing time that the Holy Spirit, you know, I got to see the manifestation of, of you know, of Jesus, you know, of, of where Amen. he walked and, you know, the Sea of Galilee and, and where he actually um, wow. washed the disciples' feet. I mean, that was wow. like the wow. most amazing That's thing amazing. that, you know, it was just to be there and it changed me. It really changed me because, you know, God just touched me. I mean, I felt the anointing when I got off the plane. So, you know what, if, I, I want to encourage all of you that if you've never been to Israel, you need to go because when you read in the Bible, and then it comes to life when you get there because, um, you know, it's so powerful and, and you get to feel Jesus. You know, you, you get to have that compassion. And I remember we were in this one room really quick, and, and this was like a, the day before Jesus was to be hung on the cross. And, and it was just this room, a small little room, like concrete room. And the Holy Spirit said, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. And I took off my shoes and everything else. And then everyone else started taking off their shoes. And everyone was just crying and crying and crying. Because we felt the Holy Spirit. We felt Jesus. And um, so anyway, that just changed my, my, whole, my whole attitude, my whole personality, my character. You know, to be like, but to be like Jesus was, was the most amazing thing in my whole entire life. And, and to come back, you know, with that anointing. And, and to really share the love um, to people, to, to show people that how much Jesus loves each and every one of you. Um, anyway, so that's, Amen. that's you know, where I, I just kind of ministered. And then in, in two years, um, I was gone for almost two years. And then I came back last um, April 2018. Oh, okay. Thank you, God saved you. Yes. Okay. So, Pastor, <laughs> I want to say Dr. Earl, because that's in the future. Uh, with this teaching gift, take us from when, uh, you know, uh, 20 years, you started your career, how, did you see yourself in the ministry right away when you got into your business career, 
or did that take a while, or how did that work? Take five minutes, and then I'll turn it over to the real pastor. Well, I think I have to kind of start back to, because I had a lot of medical problems as a kid, I really wanted to be a doctor. So I oh, ended up going to UC Irvine to be a doctor. I became disenchanted with the system, things were going bad. My mom got cancer. Mm. I then left school, was out for two years. I ended up coming back, and then I finished my degree, and then I turned degree around and, and, and did it. <laughs> what degree did you get? I have a, bi a, a BS in biological sciences. So I have a Ooh. BS in BS. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, a perfect, I'm a perfect candidate for everything. Okay? Oh, good so, but it was interesting because I then ended up remodeling a house that I had in, in Costa Mesa because I had nothing else I really wanted to do. I, I kind of my dreams were kind of crushed because I just wanted to help people. So my heart was I wanted to help people, and then I let go of the dream of being a doctor. Then ended up accidentally just doing a house for myself, adding on to it, then doing something for somebody else, somebody over here. And then I ended up professionally in construction through this process. Were you going to church, ministering a little bit, or not yet? I was. I was, but I, was, I would be like, I went to Calvary Chapel. I was okay. like, you know, just uh, doing, uh, like working in the Sunday school or whatever. And I would. Sometimes God would come in Saturday nights to do prayer counseling at midnight or whatever. Oh, so you started the phones, leadership right away. Phones oh, and all okay. kinds of different things. And so, uh, uh, that, so sometimes I saw things and heard things because that was at the tail end of the Jesus movement. Oh, yes. And so that sometimes there was things that I couldn't handle because I was raised Lutheran. So all of a sudden, as calls came in or things happened, it was like, oh, that's too much for me. And when you say no to the spirit, he'll shut it down. And so there's wow. things that shut down. And so Good. I kind of missed some different things that were going on. Got disenchanted, kind of pulled away for a while. And then ended up coming back to church after I got married when I was uh, 28 years old. I was kind of before that, but it was like I had to kind of go through a season of disappointment for a lot of things. Right. I had a power sog over my ankle and almost died. Oh my goodness. And, uh, so there was just a lot of things that went on. And then uh, I ended up then going into commercial construction. I ended up working full time there. I ended up building uh, seven apartment units, ended up remodeling 21 apartment units, ended up building a 4,550 square foot house in Costa Mesa, I ended up doing a bunch of other things while I was working full time in commercial construction. And then when it was all done, my first wife died. Mm. And then that's when my real encounters with God started happening was after that. So he just met me after she died the next day. And then I kind of always saw him after that. But even then, you times you get comfortable. At times, like I said, remarried, all of a sudden kids, you're dealing with this, you're dealing with that. Life. And yeah. life. I mean, life just pulls That's you away as you're, really as you're working. As you're still remembering God, you're trying to do the right thing, but you only have so many hours in the day. And for me, probably the thing that brought me really back into ministry was actually having my wife, <coughs> my second wife, really lose it from her past. By um, a stepson who threatened to kill us, she then went into panic attacks because of her past and things that went on in her past. And so we went through this really tough season and she finally left after six years. Mm. And so when, when you're going through those tough times, I mean, the way I would say it is, it's like, you know, Moses spent 40 years learning how to live in Pharaoh's kingdom. Then all of a sudden he lives 40 years in the wilderness to find out he's really nothing. So God can turn around and take what he learned yeah, in 40 right. years with a guy who was humble after he's been, you know, yeah. gone through it all. So now he can use you to do what he wants to do. And no. That's kind of the season I think I'm in now. Is, Amen. you know, you, your pride comes in. Your, your different things are going on. You, 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 you're living in this beautiful house. You have this. You have that. And then all of a sudden, when you go through a lot of tough times, you really find out: Do you trust God or don't you? Well done, Doctor Earl. Now let me ask you this: Is the health uh, gotten better over the years, or you're still having challenges? Put that in the back of your mind before you answer that. We gotta go to Pastor Vicky. 
because of time. And the second thing I wanted to ask uh, is the, were you still teaching during this time through this hardship or did you kind of leave, step away from the church for a while? No, actually through the hardship is when I was actually pressing in and I was actually helping out with other inner healing deliverance ministries. I was actually going to the Philippines once a year and, and just God was just training me and using me and showing me things and ministering to me in ways that was wild. I mean, there was one time, and so my wife tells me on Valentine's Day that basically the marriage is over in 2003. And then the next day I go to a Baptist church that doesn't believe in tongues. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to me through my through vibrations while the music is going on, going through the, the words up there, talking to me, and I'm like, are you kidding me? This is, this is crazy. And it was so clear what he was telling me. I'm going to take care of you. It's going to be all right. Trust me. And the people are just singing. No one believes in tongues. No one believes in miracles. The Holy Spirit's dead. And he's just like, I'm just like, are you kidding me? My wife's sitting next to me while this is going on. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Wow. Let's bring in Pastor Vicky. Now, Pastor Vicky, I know a little bit about your Pastor but take us back from the very beginning. It's not that you were born, but, you know, after that. <laughs> take us when wow. you started rebelling and what, what happened. Yeah, I would be honored to. Yeah, I pray that it would just uh, minister to someone that's listening. I, I think all of our testimonies are, are of the gospel, and certainly mine is that. I, um, As a young girl, there were five kids in our family, and I thought we were doing well until one day I heard my mom come home and basically said that she was going to be moving out with my younger brother and leaving. And so it was a rude awakening as a young girl. My mom today is saved and, and is such an incredibly oh, yeah. loving, amazing person. But um, my parents, like many of you, you know, made tremendous mistakes, you know, as, as we all do, unfortunately, as parents sometimes. But um, I was really lost as a young girl, and I had siblings raising me that were still in high school. So the parties began at our home, and I ended up just really rebelling. I got to, into drugs. I outdid all of my siblings. I became a runaway, you know, and as far as rebellion was concerned, I outdid them all. And I sold drugs at my school, and um, I was just an absolute mess. And I just remember feeling and sensing just, why doesn't anyone see me? Doesn't anyone see my pain? And and I just, I didn't feel loved. I did, had, there were no structure, there was no boundaries, and I just, I just took it all. And um, I ended up going to a church service towards the end of high school, and I was smack in the middle of rebellion, and I sat next to my mom, and I used to, at that time, go to church every single week. She forced us. And I would go once a week, and I felt like God was in the building, but in the moment I left the door, he was in the church and not with me. Mm, and it good. was a big that's change really because what I experienced okay. was I felt like sitting in that church that one Sunday, as I, I felt the presence of God all around me. I knew something was different. I had never experienced anything like it before. And I had tears in my eyes, and I had this tiny diamond ring that my mom had bought me. And I looked down at the diamond ring, and I literally saw Jesus' eye on me and his reflection, just his, his one eye, just look at me. And in that look was just absolute pure love. It was okay. acceptance. It was, you're my daughter. I love you. He didn't see my rebellion. He didn't see my sin. He didn't see any of it. He just, it was full acceptance. And at that moment, the addiction just fell from me. I never once to this day had any desire to use drugs again. And at that moment, I didn't even tell anyone about the experience for many, many years. Mm -hmm. It was so deep and so special. But I have lived my adult life looking into the eye of Jesus. And still, I'm unfolding exactly what that was, that look in his eyes. I'm still, I'm so, I have mm. such incredible pleasure and such joy of unfolding who I am to him. Because the more I understand who he is, the more I understand who I am because he lives inside of me. And so I, was, I think it was that moment when I was marked. And I think there's moments in our life that we're just marked by the Holy Spirit forever uh -huh. and that we're changed. So that began this amazing, intimate, deep, personal relationship. And I just got so hungry for the Word of God. I just saturated myself. I, mean, I had to know who Jesus was. Mm -hmm. I had to know who God was. And I really questioned even the deity of Christ. I didn't understand. I knew Jesus 
was was true. I, well, he was a prophet, but I didn't quite understand he was God. And I knew I needed to in order to be saved. And so I just went on this deep quest for a, so, a solid year. And I'm so thankful that I did because in the word is where I found the truth because he is the truth. And I'm so thankful for that um, amazing experience. But my the compassion kept filling me. The Father's compassion kept filling me more and more as it has continued to do all these years later. Mm -hmm. And the, the scripture that really came to my mind, uh, my dad had forced me, he said, you've got to watch the Ten Commandments when I was a young girl. And we sat there and watched the Ten Commandments together. I was probably like 20 years old. And we watched this long movie together. And I know that Holy Spirit was already moving in my heart and wooing me and drawing me near to him. And it was so profound, but after I left that day, I drove home for 40, about five minutes, a good, a good 40 minutes all the way home, and I cried out to God. And I saw Moses being used so much in this beautiful movie, and I said, use me like Moses, and I cried out to God, and I cried out to God, because God told Moses that he, that he heard the cries of the Israelites, and he sent Moses. And I knew that there was a world of pain around me. I knew that there were people hurting all around me, and this overwhelming love came and Amen. to this day continues to fill me and really changed my life so I'm sitting here today and how old were you when you got saved I well I was um, raised in a Christian home for sure but um, I think it was at the end of high school it was it was that one look that just drew me in forever and I got filled and born again at that moment and have been forever changed and the very Amen. thing I kept saying was doesn't anyone see me it turns out he did all along. He was the one who saw me. And his name is El Ra'i, the God who sees. So he sees us where we are with pure Amen. love in his eyes and acceptance. Amen. Good word, good word. Uh, leave it there when we come back. Look now, this is something you'll never hear me say again when I said go for five minutes. That'll never happen again. <laughs> I've done the two. But I'll go 20. Like I did last night. Yeah. No, okay. So uh, for time, folks, the reason why I do like this community acting is because we have to steward the time. And I want everybody to pray. How did you get started in the ministry? And that way you understand how we all started. Now, everybody was saved at the early age. I'm 175. So I started late. I was in my 40s when I got saved. And I knew the greatest ministers alive, or I thought. And what I was tainted by all that. In fact, I left the church. I couldn't decide what the difference between is the nightclubs and the church, same loud music, they passed an offering around. I thought it was the waitress for a tip, and I threw the money in like I always did, but I didn't get a drink, I was still waiting. So here's my point to this is, I want to take you from the other side, and I'll just take a couple minutes, I'll say as I'm gonna do, but I might not do as I say. But and what I did was, when I first got saved, and I want to say this, look not, to be the greatest is to come as a little child. To be a humble servant, that's to be the greatest. That's what Jesus. Now, Amen. notice that was in Luke 9. Now, watch this. It, it's in other places, but hear me on this. It was in Matthew, he talks about, you know, uh, who would be the greatest. He would, John and, and James were arguing. They were brothers, right? Yes. Interesting civil uh, rivalry there, but John was the beloved. He was the beloved one. But I, I want to go here. I'll, I won't go there yet. But. We are, we are trying to, uh, we're humble as little children, as Jesus said. Now watch this. Everybody in the church I went to is very charismatic. They moved in signs and wonders. None of us knew the word, but we, everybody was raising the dead, praying for the sick, and giving words and all that. But interesting enough, nobody really knew the word. Nobody really had. And I was the perfect believer then. I had money, and I didn't know the word. So I just did everything they said. Does anybody relate to that? But hear what I'm saying. When I finally started opening up the book, because some of the things didn't add up, some things seemed wrong. Everybody wasn't loving. Everybody wasn't going the other. They took your offering four or five times every service. It was all about money. I, I was practically the pastor because I spent the most money, and I thought, wait a minute. I don't even know what the book says. Why am I the pastor? I don't even know what to say. But everybody wanted to be like a pastor because he was a movie star in his own right. A lot of movie stars in the day, I, I got there later, but when he was at 3,500, I mean, he was a follower. The movie stars came from all over to be with him. Wow. Now, interesting enough, if that Hollywood spirit, hear me, we get that now, guys. With some, I'm not saying that the ministers are bad. They're all great speakers. But sometimes we get caught up in them and not who sent them. So what I'm here to say is this, is I thought it was very, very interesting. Watch this. Matthew says, 
about the uh, two men that were demon-possessed. Pastor, where is that? The two men that were demon-possessed. He said two, but Luke, Luke never met Jesus. Matthew hung out with him. Hear me. He said the one man that was demon-possessed. Who was right? Matthew was there, but Luke had started the gospel. He had a perfect uh, witness account by what Paul told him. But Paul didn't know Jesus. I mean, he knew him in visions, but he wasn't there when he walked the earth. Who's right? I'll leave you right there for a second. I want to go on to one more thing, and I'll come back and answer that. But now, here's where I see the ministry as we start. When you hear these great men of God, they're giving words, they're prophesying. Who's to say we have to judge every word? People say you can't judge, or you'll be judged. That's true, but if you judge like Jesus, because in Revelations it says, whoever will rule and reign and judge with him, as Jesus himself. So we have to judge properly. We have to understand what the word, what the minister is saying. So we need to go home and look these scriptures up. Take notes. Understand what, it might be a teaching moment. They're, maybe they're great teachers, but sometimes they misquote. Sometimes they have different communicate. Go, so what's going on in their life? I found out some of the pastors I knew because of their struggles, their married life, some of the secret sins that they had, and I won't say who, but I mean, some of the greatest ministers that walked the planet 20 years ago, I thought it was very interesting. They could move in signs and wonders, but sometimes the character didn't add up. So to me, I, I couldn't tell the difference. That's why I wanted to leave the church. Is that you? How many times have you gone to church and you're not really understanding what they're saying, but they say they're moving in love, but their, their offerings take five hours each one. I mean, it gets a little overbearing. You think, are they after my money? Is it, are they, nobody will pray for me. How come nobody asked me to come up and want to know what I think? Or how come nobody prayed for me? I'm hurting. My marriage is struggling. I need a job. Well, why aren't you praying for me? You said God would answer my prayers. And I didn't even know how to pray. Could you teach me? So what I did is I finally opened the book. It was a, Now, remember, I had a 10th grade education. I've been in prison. I mean, I got a story, but we don't have time for all that. And I wasn't going to take 20 minutes, I said. But as I looked at the book and finally figured out oh, how 18. to read that yeah, 18 and a half. But You're cut off. 18 means life. That's interesting that you said that. But anyway, uh, I started reading the word, and I found out, well, wait a minute. How do I know what they're saying lines up? That's not what it says. And the scriptures are quoting, that's not even there. Where are they getting this from? So I want to tell you, you have to be accountable to Amen. him. You can't be accountable to one man. If you have a great teacher, you have a good minister, that's a great mentor, a father like Dr. Earl. Very important to have one. Have somebody that can speak in your life. But until then, you've got your book. you got the Bible. That's right. You can get around with people that are co-laboring with you that want to know the Word and read it together. And it says that two or more agree, Matthew 18, 19, right. He'll be in the midst. The answer to your question about the two and one, interesting thought, I had Apostle Paul on, not the real one in the Bible, the other one. I, I wonder sometimes. <laughs> but anyway, he said it's a double witness. So in Matthew, they had the two, but Luke had the one. He spoke, he, if Jesus even said in and Luke, he said, you men, you men, and Matthew was man. Interesting. But he said it was a double witness. The Bible is a witness to the testimony of what he said. Jesus spoke it. The apostles wrote it down in witness. Now, are all of them apostles? Let me just say this, and I'll close and give it to the apostle, the real apostle, Cor, and she wasn't there that day. But Apostle Matthew was an apostle, but look at this. Mark was, think about it, then you have to know who you're reading when you read the Gospels. Well, who are they really so you understand their perspective? Here we go again, the teacher, you're going to church, they're teaching. Now, but if you don't know the men in the Bible and what Jesus said, now you might be lost. Now Mark was an evangelist. He was Paul's disciple, or was a disciple of Paul. And then you move forward. You listen to Luke. Luke was another one of Paul's disciples. And then you go back to John. That was the beloved that was really there with Jesus. So when you put all those together and the book of Acts, which Luke did, Luke is a very accurate, educated man that knew every detail. But Matthew was a tax collector, knew how to write, and was very educated as well. That's how he cheated the people out of the money and all that. But as he changed his ways and saw Christ, that's what made a new beginning for him. So I want to say this. If you're not in the Word, if you're not going to the right Bible, so I don't care who, if it's Dr. Earl himself, you have to get that Word out and question every Amen. single thing they say. Even though it's extremely accurate, he's one of the best teachers I know. I'm just saying, you have to protect yourself and know what God is saying to you individually. Apostle Titus from... 
Uh, and we started out with, uh, uh, you, uh, not when you got here, but you prophesied to me two years ago, we're on another TV set, that we would be doing this channel. Can you take us from there? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, yes. You know, I, I think that when you get around the anointing, when you're around men and women of God, I mean, that oil just has to fall off of that person onto the other person and so forth. It just, it's a trickling effect. And so that's the reason why Jesus wants us to be with like-minded Christians, like-minded people of God. Because, see, then you fellowship. And when you're fellowshipping, you get to encourage one another. You get to pray for one another. Yeah. You get to lift each other up. And you get to um, bear their, their burdens, you know, and, and, and take their burdens away so that we can give them to Jesus. You know, and so that's how we build up each other. We, we edify and encourage one another so that the Holy Spirit can continue to do the work that he first started in them so that they can go to their purpose or, you know, that, so they can be in their purpose so they can go to their destiny. Amen. So, you know, that, that's all God was having me do was, was you know, it's just like I can, I can go back when I was in junior high and high school when I wanted to be on TV. And I didn't do TV as an adult. I was a human resource manager. That was my career. When you saw yourself, right? When I saw myself. Talk about the vision, go ahead. Yeah, so, so my vision was, of course, to, to be on TV. I wanted to be on TV. But it wasn't, you know, it was, it was to be a broadcaster for the world. And Jesus is like, no, I'm not going to let you be a broadcaster for the world. I'm going to let you be the broadcaster for my kingdom. Oh, and yeah. so, you know, that's that's where, you know, the excitement comes in. That's where the fire comes in. You know, and, and I, you know, I want to encourage all of you that even though that, you know, you might be doing something that you don't want to do right now, you should be rejoicing because you don't even know the plans that God has for you. I mean, there's greater plans for you. You know, it's like eyes have not seen, ears have not heard for what God is about to do in your Amen. world. So you should be rejoicing. Even though you're being afflicted, you should be rejoicing every single time that the enemy tries to attack you and just say, Lord, I honor you, I praise you, I thank you. And, you know, and I can't wait to get there because it will surely come. Happy get two, two and three. Even though it says write down the vision, for it may it may wait a little bit, it may tarry. That means that God is processing you. He's processing you to be that person, that man or woman of God that He has destined you to be. Okay, so you know what? Just rejoice, you know, and prepare. You know, like the, like the apostle said, you know, read your word of God, read it, you know, understand it, get around other people. And, and God will do it. He will do it for you. As he has done it for Amen. me, he will do it for you too. Hallelujah. Amen. Good word. Now, I want to speak into that. That was a great, great teaching yes. moment right there. She said, Luke 9, 53 and 54, but we have to build the character first. I'll show you where that is in case you don't have your Bible out. They were talking about Jesus went to a city and they didn't receive them. I want you to read it so you know what I'm talking about, but I'll paraphrase real quickly. And then John and James said, you want us to call down fire? And Jesus said, no, I didn't come for the sinners, I'm paraphrasing here, but I came for the, uh, uh, I, I came for the sinners, I didn't come for the saved, I'm paraphrasing. What he meant was he didn't come to condemn men, he came to save man. Hallelujah. So now watch this. If we get on our religious platform before we get Dr. Earl on, I want to say this. is, uh, And I thought it was a great point the Apostle makes. Is if we're in church and we're judging everybody. That's why it's so hard sometimes for me to go out to the churches. They're all saved. Why am I going? Everybody wants a ministry. They want to be like the pastor. Those are his people. Where are yours? I'll tell you where they are. Walk out your front door. That's what they are. But when, Hallelujah. What, what I want to say is that's why Jesus, out of the 50 miracles, 36 were done in the marketplace. Why was that? Most of the people were saved, were religious, and he didn't come for the religious people. He didn't come for the saved people. Right. It's for the people that didn't know who he was, and even the saved people didn't know who he was. Dr. Earl, your thought, and take us a little bit deeper where you started out more ministry as you got to see us here today. And we need time to pray for everybody. Okay. Uh, let me just answer a couple of things I heard you say. So one is, Mark is Barnabas's relative who actually caused Paul and Barnabas to get into an argument split, which actually looked bad, but God used it for the good. Can I ask you this? Could Peter, I'm asking, yeah. 
Could that be his father? Could it be Peter's father? No, Peter could be father tomorrow. Could it? I'll show you where that is. So. Interesting. I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying, get your Bible out and look it up. Okay, so the second one, really fast, was, okay, I love my wife. I love an ice cream cone. Judging is used a couple different ways, and we get off in the English language. So judging is, a judge is the one who actually sentences someone to prison. He makes that judgment call. Jesus is that judge. Amen. Go to John 5, I think it's 25, or right there. Jesus is the judge. The Father said he is the judge. That's it. And ahead. so, but you go to Matthew 7, and now judging is, we're not to be the judge, but we're to be discerning. We're to be testing what people say. We're to be looking at what it is the scriptures say, what it is they're saying. Are they off? Are they right? Discerning the more of it. So, I just want to clean that up. So now, back to like that. So for me, a couple of uh, because my wife left, and then I ended up losing my house that I built. I designed it. I built it down in San Clemente. I was going to retire there. So my pride, my ego, my all these wow. different things are going on. I'm having to deal with this eight to ten year long divorce. Things up. I'm like every time I go, God, it can't get any worse. I know you're on my side. I'm tithing. I'm doing all the right things. Boom! It was just perfect storm times two, so many different times. And but he's like, Are you gonna trust me? And so I went to the Philippines, and I ended up speaking one time, and then he would come to me at 2 o'clock in the morning and just give me all this revelation and talk to me every day for like almost two hours when I went the first time. Next time I come back, I say, okay, I want to pray and prophesy over people. I then end up praying and prophesying over people three hours after the service is over because a 100 something people lined up. I just kept going. Okay. Then the time I come back, so you're just, it's like he just met me in so many ways. One time they said to me, Five minutes before the speaker was supposed to speak, who didn't show up. So you have 800 people that go, hey, do you want to go up and speak? And I'm like, are you crazy? What? You know, and I'm like, no. But you know what's funny is, is God prompted that because the next year I spoke. Mm -hmm. I thought they were crazy, but God was testing me. He was preparing me. The next year I spoke, when I spoke, I watched 200 people come forward to accept Jesus Amen. Christ. And they all were like looking wow. like we've never had that many people ever come forward before to accept Christ. So, and then and then another time I came and spoke and they brought a, a person that was on a stretcher later down in front of me to for me to pray for her to get That's healed. Awesome. And so I'm like, as I'm trying to speak to the audience, I'm going, God, give me faith. <laughs> Give me, I want to pray. I want to see this woman. Give me the faith to do that. Give me the faith. And then I finished. I ended up sitting down. And I literally, it was like I was electrocuted for 10 minutes. I sat there in a chair. I could not speak. I couldn't. Uh, it was like God was just moving through me. And I couldn't even explain it. I got up. I went over. I prayed for this woman. And she did not get up. But I, no one in the audience could see, but I'm watching her eyes as I was praying for her, and her eyes just were like going all over the place. And I knew God was touching her. I knew God was moving at her. And I thought healing had to be because she got up and walked. I believe God was healing her mind and her emotions and her spirit. Yes, he was amen. healing what he needed to heal in her and teaching me just to trust him and accept what was going on. And then I just had gone down and just learned so much every time learning something different. And then going through other healing ministries where I was praying for people. And I remember one time praying for a woman who came up to me. And I started to pray for her. And she flew backwards about four or five feet. Oh my and, I, and I'm like, I'm looking like, what happened? And people are looking at me like, what did you just do? I don't know what I did because I didn't do anything. You know, but God, God just tests you. He just tests you because are you going to be prideful? Are you going to glorify him? What are you going to do as he's doing things through you? And I just watched so many different things of praying for people, healings, deliverances, all kinds of things. But whenever 
I get focused on me, then I'm going to go backwards. But when I keep focused on Him and That's glorify good. Him, I move forward, I pass the Amen. Test. Good work. So Luke 10, 22 says, Only the people knew about the Father or the one that's Son chose to tell them. So interesting thought that as he looked at Jesus and forgot about himself, that things start to manifest. Of course, it's, it's by sight. As we always, and I talk about that all the time, we're praying for people, you don't even, I never ask, is that word accurate or when they're praying if they're healed, because it's God anyway. I don't know what I'm saying. Here's my point. I think we have an idea. We're praying for victory. And by his stripes we're healed. I'll give you one real quick. Isaiah 53, 5. It says, by your stripes, I'm healed. So that's it. We're praying for victory. We're thanking him for Amen. the victory. It's up to God. Now, watch this. We walk that out. That is the key to the scriptures. So as we walk this out, i got to say one more thing before the pastor gets on. And then I want everybody to pray. We're really focused here at Vision TV. We mentioned the word, build your faith, but we pray for the need. And I know you're broken out there. You're wondering... You know, I'm called to the ministry, but I don't understand what it is. We want to talk about that tonight, and I want to hear more of our testimony. But let me just say this. Matthew uh, 25, I want to show you something. We talked about this last night. There was a talent. It was 75 pounds. Uh, Dr. Earl, you can do the math better than I can. It was 75 pounds. That's what an average talent was in those days. Gold is trading for $1,349 an hour. Do the math. 12 ounces to a pound. Did you hear that? 12 ounces to a pound. So it's over a million and a half. Can wow. we say that? Here's my point. There's more talents in you. Am I preaching anything? Amen. Here? There's yeah. more talents in you the gold, than you thought there was. You. <laughs> so what I'm saying, they thought the town was a little teeny brick that was worth, you know, a dinero or whatever. Now, it was 1.5 million at least. What are you worth? Hear me. The talents and gifts that are calling you, that's why the enemy is terrified of you and doesn't want you to see you. That's why they try to rape and pillage uh, apostles not be able to talk. That's why Dr. Earl hasn't ever got the Amen. biggest platform because his teaching is off the chart. That's why Pastor Vicky hasn't uh, raised the dead up on national TV yet because the enemy is trying to kill her through, through all these other things. From unbelief down, that she's not worthy, whatever it is. She's got the power. Speaking of power, tell us how you got connected with the ministry and how you start moving in the signs and wonders that you do. Amen. Well, I think, two minutes left. I think it was um, probably about five or six years ago. I was um, I spent a couple decades of serving God and being obedient to God and understanding that I was a living sacrifice for and living for Christ as an adult, and then I would say five or six years ago, I was introduced to a, a ministry up in Redding, California called Bethel, and I started uh, watching online the teaching, and I saw people moving in signs and wonders, and I was um, really moved by what I saw. I didn't, I, I didn't even know signs and wonders were on the radar, on the grid, in, in any way, shape, or form. I just knew I had this deep, intimate relationship with, with God, and so what I did was I started researching, and I ended up going to Jesus Culture Conference, which is up in LA, and I saw maybe five or 6,000 uh, people. They were mostly young adults that were there and teenagers. And then during the breaks, they asked us all to go out and pray and pray for the sick. And that was my first experience. And I saw freckle-faced 14-year-old kids praying for people. And I knew, I'm like, Jesus, if you could do that in them, you could do that in me. Yeah. And I, I just believed, I absolutely believed. So they just, they said, go out to the university, walk by Universal Studios, and just start to minister and love people. And they really had this beautiful foundation of love and, and honor towards people when we approached them on the streets. And that's what began. I knew it was available. I knew God could move through someone, and I wanted him to pick me. And I wasn't going to stop until I saw him move through me. And um, I definitely changed tremendously in the last five or six years because now I have seen God move Amen. mightily in me. But what I've done now is my, he's changed me so much because what he taught me was I wasn't about results. I actually felt like he said that to me, that I wasn't results driven, that I was presence driven. Amen. And it's releasing the presence of God because people won't, they won't forget an encounter. They'll forget their sprained toe. They'll forget the shoulder that was aching, but they won't forget the encounter Amen. that they had. And that makes them hungry for more. Just like for me, as I had an encounter as a teenager. So I think that's what began this ministry, and because of my compassion, 
how God had healed me and forgiven me that I wanted to see people around me free, free from pain, free from forgiveness, free from addiction, whatever that might be. Amen. That works. Now, as we go around, Apostle, start with uh, what you do best. Pray for the people. Doctor, or maybe you might want to teach or give a word or whatever you want to do. And then you pray for the signs and wonders for the people, and I'll do the comic. No, I'll say something. <laughs> but what Pastor Vicky was saying is, you know, you can't take yourself too seriously. Either it's God or it's not. That's my ministry right there. Here's my thought. In Hebrews 10.35, oh, he knows the scripture. Yes, I do. That means I have to trust in Him. Either I trust in Him or I don't do it. Amen. So, what is this signs and wonders? First Corinthians fourteen. Another one. I know you're shocked. Fourteen one. It says we can cover the gifts of the Spirit. So if that's true. We can cover. Now watch this. Mark sixteen all the way up to twenty. It says those. I'm paraphrasing. Those who believe signs and wonders shall follow. So if that is true. If all you have to do is believe. Now remember the part where, and maybe Doctor Irvin tell us what this is in Matthew. I think it is. It talked about the 72 he sent out. Not 70. It says 72. I'll show you 72. Yeah, it was 72. I was shocked too. Maybe it's in a different version. I'll show you where it is. I really might be spiritual. He doesn't know this one. 72. Anyway, whatever it was, I thought it was 72, and I've been quoting 70 all week, but I found 72, and I'll show it to you. I think the 70 went out two by two. No, it says 70. But anyway, if I'm wrong, I'm right. It doesn't matter. It's 70 or 72. If Dr. says 70, it's probably 70. But I want to show you something. They didn't spend a long time. He said, go out. Like he said, two by two. Interesting enough, they came back happy. It says in the easy to read version. Maybe that's what you're not seeing. It's easy to read. It's too spiritual for you to see. But my point being is they, they were happy with the results because they did it in his name. That's where I want to go with this. So if that is true, Jesus' name, it says in Philippians 2, 9, and 10, his name is above all men. Every knee has that's to right. bow. That's so right. it's heaven, earth, under the earth, whatever it is. They have to bow to sickness, anything, finances, anything. So you pray, pray in Jesus' name, and with your faith, watch what God will do. Now remember, you agree with his word, and you have the Holy Spirit with you. That's the two agreement. Whatever you say, if you're saying his word, it has to be done. Your final thought to pray for the people to release what you've been through, abuse, and all these things that got you in the ministry. Give them something to really hang on to as we go. One of the things that I really want to encourage each and every one of you who has gone through any sort of abuse, physical, emotional, verbal, sexual, whatever it's been, is that you need to forgive those people who did that to you. And then you need to ask God to bless them, and then you need to forgive yourself. Because the power lies within you. Because God gave that to you so that you could be free, so that you could be like me, so that I can... So that you can speak to the world out there to share love, to show the love of Jesus and how much Jesus loves you. So, you know, tonight I just pray that the Holy Spirit just touches your heart, that he relinquishes all that stuff that is behind you right now, and that you can move forward. And, and by being positive and looking to the light of, of, of Jesus and, 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 and quit looking in the darkness and quit going back in the past. But going forward, moving forward in his love and his light. And, and get the Father's heart. Get the Father's heart so that you can embrace his heart. So he can embrace you. Because you need to have that encounter with him so that you can be free. So I break up any strongholds over your life right now in the yes. name of Jesus. And Father God, I just ask you to bless them right now, Father God. I just ask you, Father God, to bless each person, Father, that they will come out of this, Father. That they are an overcomer, Lord. That they are an overachiever, Father God. That they are more than a conqueror, Father God. That they are victorious, Father. We bless them tonight, Father God. They will receive it, Lord. And that's all they need to do is just receive the word tonight. And I'm telling you, God will bless you. We are here from 6.30 to 10 o'clock, Monday through Saturday. I'm here to pray. We are all here to pray for you. If you want to need help, if you need help to be delivered, we're here for you. God bless each and every one of you tonight. We love you so much. Good work. Don't believe the lies of the enemy. Amen. Don't believe the lies of the enemy that you're disqualified because of something you did in your past. Don't believe that the shame or the guilt or condemnation or whatever it is that you're believing, it's a lie. He's paid for it all. Whatever you've gone through in your past, he wants to use to be your platform Amen. for your future. Amen. He wants that to be the platform.
to help others to get free. That's right. As you have overcome, you now have the ability Hallelujah. to use to help others overcome. That's right. Hallelujah. As you have the testimony Thank that you, you overcome. Even if you're in the process of that testimony, know that you're in process because he wants to give you that testimony of freedom. He wants to give you that testimony of overcoming so that you can be used to glorify him in other people's lives so you can be that encouragement, that hope that they don't give up because if you made it through, then they can make it through and you can encourage and speak into them. And you know what? It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much money you've lost. I've lost millions of dollars through a divorce. It doesn't matter. Sometimes that actually makes you even more prepared to be used by him because all of a sudden you're not trusting in yourself. Yeah. I got I used to trust in my own ways. I used to trust in my own skills. Come on. I was an orphan because I learned to trust in myself and not trust in God. He goes, I I hear your yeah. prayers that you want to be used by me, so I need to get rid of this stuff so that you learn to not trust in the stuff, trust in your own strength, trust in your own ways, and you learn to trust in me and do what I tell you to do, not what you're telling me I should do. So, you know what? That's for you guys, that you need to just come and just trust him, to be used by him. No matter what you've gone through, it is now just something that is your platform to bring you to a higher level if you're willing to submit yourself to him, if you're willing to be humble for him, if you're willing to glorify him, Hallelujah. if he's going to glorify you, it's going to go away. So I just pray right now that yes, the Holy Lord. Spirit just give them the revelation yes, on what you can accomplish yes, through their lives, how you want to give them that yes, testimony Lord. of their overcoming, how you want to use them in greater ways, how you want to use them to glorify you, that they are just now either starting to get right where you want them to be or you're in the process of getting them right there or they're almost there to where they're going to be used by you in greater ways. So don't lose hope. Keep your eyes on him. Yeah. Know that you can give him everything that happened in your past and he will make it clean. So just accept that. Pray that. When the enemy comes and lies to you, just stand right there and say, Go in Jesus' name. I'm not going to believe your lies anymore. Amen. Good one. So, uh, Prophet, give it, take us home. Give us a, a prayer. What are the people really believing for? In Psalm 68, 19, it says, Every day God thinks of you. So I feel like there's a deliverance. There's maybe a healing. Whatever God's giving you, pray for the people. By the way, Luke 10, 1, and the E, V, uh, e V R V or E R V easy to read. After the Lord chose seventy two more followers, he sent them out two by two. So I'm back to being the pastor. Your thought on uh, what the people need? He says, I, have, I have to be humble. <laughs> Amen. Wow, I'm just like so touched. I just feel God's presence so strong tonight, and I just know that there are people watching all over that just need just a fresh touch. Love is so powerful. The love from the Father is so powerful, and it can absolutely change your entire life in every single way, shape, or form. How you how you do marriage, how you do family, how you do community, in every single way, how you show up to work. I just release that right now. I just release the perfect love of the Father over yep. every single person, every person in this room, every single person watching right now. The perfect love from the Father. Oh, yeah, yeah. That you would know you are radically loved by God. And he just wants you to know that. And as he saw me, as he saw me without sin, as he loved me, that, that he, if he could do that in my life, he can do that in yours. And I just pray that there's, I feel like there's parents that are, their kids are rebelling, that their kids are into drugs, and you're just not sure where to turn or what to do. But pray for an encounter. And we just do right now, each one of us agree for an encounter, that your son, that your daughter would have an encounter with the living God, that they would show, and that the Holy Spirit would just be so real in their life and to show an incredible way. I just release healing over marriages right now. Your marriage matters to the Father. Your marriage matters. And just as I've learned, as the Holy Spirit's taught me to, and asked my husband to not concentrate on my weakness, but to focus and connect to the strength and the, and the greatness that God's put in me, that I'm made in God's image. My spirit is made in God's image, and the same thing for him. 
that he is made in God's image, and I want to connect to the greatness inside of him, and I want to pull that to the surface and let everyone else see that. And I just release healing over marriages, healing over families right now in Jesus' name. The love of the Father just fill you tonight. Hallelujah. Good work. Let me close with this. If I've got a quarter, we've got a half hour. No. We only got a minute left, so I'll close with this. The prophet doesn't speak the future to the people, but the prophet speaks the people into the future. Here's what I want to say. Be bold enough to wear your gifts God has given you. There's so many people out there in our audience right now who are saying, well, how do I get into this? Or here's something. 1 Peter 4.10 says, God has given each one of you a gift with this great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them to serve one another. Another thought. Christ has called us to change the world if we don't, who will? Or the whole world starts where? In your world. The sphere of your influence. Is the world around you serving Christ? Are you? Who can you, uh, how, what can you do differently? How can you encourage? <coughs> Something to think about. Now, I know this. There's people out there saying, you know, I've got called to the ministry. I can prophesy the pain off the walls. So can everybody up here. But I can raise the dead. So is everybody else. They got me out of that today, right? <laughs> Second thought is, there is power hidden. Hebrew, uh, Habakkuk 3, 4. Now, if that is all true, he's hidden this power into us. It doesn't mean media sees it all the time. He's hidden it for our protection. Sometimes... We step out too quickly. Sometimes it keeps the view from mass society. Sometimes when we seek God's power, it's maybe behind closed doors because if you give it to us openly, we couldn't handle it. Success ministry doesn't mean popularity or fame. Luke 6, 26 says, Woe to you who will people will speak well of you, for the false prophets were from our forefathers. In other words, they watch them. They look at them, their forefathers. So isn't it interesting that even the most popular ministries of the day may or may not be on target with what God is using them for? So I want to close with one last thought. I believe that each and every one of you out there is called to the ministry, and you're all spiritual superstars in your own life. As Psalms 84, 11, it says, Never I lack honor, abundance, riches, splendor, glory, dignity, reputation, or reverence. Reverence is respect and honor. If you'll follow God, if you'll be obedient, you will have reverence and respect from the Father Himself. Mm -hmm. Until next week, I'm Dr. Jan, of course, the Apostle of course with us. Dr. Earl's always with us. We love you. And the prophet herself, um, Vicki, will join us next week on Pastor's Talk. Thanks for watching. Bless you. Amen. Bless you, bless you. Oh, here. Yes. Whose phone oh, was it? Phone. Joshua. Oh, it was? Yes. You're in